Hey, welcome into the Sneaky Truth Podcast. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. Thank you for subscribing. Numbers are growing continually. Please share it with all, all your friends and family. If you love it, if you don't like it, keep your freaking mouth shut. Uh, I am Mark Schlerth. He is Mike Evans. Mike, how are you, buddy? I'm doing great. we got Good. a lot to get to, a lot of topics, as we're only about a couple of weeks away from yeah, the yeah, NFL well, draft. Okay, so but before we get to that, how about Space Nerd yesterday? Did you did you get a load of Space Nerd yesterday? The, my, the eclipse? Oh my gosh. Space Nerd. Space Nerd on TV. Okay. So my wife's got the news on, and I'm like, oh my God, it's gonna start now. Oh, oh, we'll be it's a golden ring. It's a golden ring. Like, shut up, Space Nerd. Like, okay, I get it. The moon gets in front of the sun. Boom, there's a shadow. Hey, well, why don't we know? Hey, let's get a, a shot of a cloud. Watch the cloud go in front of the sun. Look. Oh, it's gotten shady. Ooh, the temperature dropped. All like, right. I, well, wait a minute. Dude, okay. give me a freaking I, break with I, Space Nerd. I get that it was a little over the top at times. And you're, a little you're, over the you're, top? Your astronomers <laughs> were going equal oh parts God. geeked out and snooty professor you clearly don't know what you're watching. Let me explain it to you. I get all that, <sighs> uh-huh. but, but come on. The idea that it could go from bright sunshine oh to to nighttime darkness in the span of a couple of minutes and then right back yeah. to daytime yeah. bright isn't something yeah, that you I've, find interesting. I've laid interesting? on the beach before. I've laid on the beach before in Hawaii, and it was bright sunshine and then a big cloud blocked the sun. It didn't get dark out, though. And it got... Well, it got darker. It didn't get dark, dark. It like got nighttime darker. dark. Dude. Come I'm, on. I, like, science Where's boy. Where's your sense of wonder? Did you not want to go out and just beat up a science kid? Like, did you not want to just go out and punch <laughs> a science dude in the nose? Well, I did. Come I on. personally. You can never, I hope we never get bored with the wonder of science. With shadows? You ever chase your shadow? What are you, Peter Pan? Like, dude, I, I, I was like... I thought it what was. I, what am I supposed to do with this guy? <laughs> I just thought it was ridiculous. Although I would I, say, I would say this. I would was say this. It, well, okay. Was the coverage of it on national television not insanely stupid? Well, it was stupid if you stuck with it once you saw it pass through one city. Like I saw it when it went through Dallas, mm-hmm. and I was like, "All right, that's kind of cool." But then it goes to Indy, then it goes to Cleveland, and then it ends up in. Houghton, Maine, or someplace right. like that. And if you, because at that point, you know what's coming, and right. you watch these announcers and, and how they react, you already know how they're going to yeah. react. Well, I so just, at that point, if you stuck with it that long, I could see how. But if you, you know, just caught a couple of right. places, I thought it was pretty I cool. I caught one broadcast, the guy was screaming, going on and on and on about the wedding ring, and oh, it was so beautiful. And then he stumbled when he was throwing it to break and goes, you could see I'm emotional, like something like, I'm emotionally, like I'm, I'm a little bit lost for words right now with the emotion. <laughs> I'm like, you got to be shitting me. I mean, what a pussy. <laughs> like, like, I just like, would we move on? And can we move on from Astro Boy? Wow. Lord have wow. mercy. I apologize you would, for my language. You would not last long <laughs> on the SSN, USS Enterprise. Because your interest in going where no man has ever I gone did, before, did, you'd did, be like, eh, been there, done that, me. not interested. It did interest me enough to read an article and I found a one article really incredible that they've actually, with a high-powered telescope, they have actually found life on a planet. Okay. Yeah, they found uh, corn in your anus. <laughs> corn. corn in your anus. <laughs> I don't know whether to laugh or cry, people. I, I, I really don't. Oh, that's a good one. I really that don't. Is a, oh, yeah. That's a good one. That's a knee slapper right there. <laughs> okay. That's a knee slapper. All right, I've, said All right, my, you ready? I've, I've had my piece. Are you ready to talk some football sure, here? why not? This is why people come here, not for your takes on uh, science. Uh, space. Space nerds. Okay. What do you call them, space nerds? Space nerds. Space nerds. Astro space boys, boys. Whatever they are, yeah. Um. So... Merrill Hodge, you you know Merrill pretty well from your Hodge's my boy. Yeah, I love Merrill. Your days, yeah, at ESPN, Idaho State. By the way, Merrill Hodge played at Idaho State. I played at Idaho. So bitter let's, rivals. Let's establish his his credentials, his bona fides. Uh, Is this a guy who you respect for the work he puts into evaluating players, absolutely. evaluating film? Absolutely. When we worked together at ESPN, Merrill covered the draft. I mean, forever. Okay. And dude, that dude nailed so many 
Like he would just come out and say, "This dude's not going to play well at the NFL level." Let's do the, and he would be right. So there were so many times he was just dead. I mean, just dead on. So against that backdrop, then here's what he had to say about Drake May, who who many people feel will either be the second or third quarterback mm-hmm. off the board. He said, "Quote: Drake May is the kind of player that will get you fired, especially if you draft him in the top five or top three. He's going to get you fired. I studied him for two years. I watched every one of his games last year. His last game against North Carolina State was probably the most embarrassing display I've seen from a guy who is supposed to be an elite franchise quarterback. He's erratic. He's everywhere. Yeah. Um. So you know that I evaluated Drake Mann. I didn't watch a, a year's worth of tape. I watched several games that he played. And my evaluation for you, as we do a, a local radio show here in Denver, Colorado, and we're talking about the draft all the time, and you know the Broncos are you know obviously minus a quarterback since they moved on from uh, everybody's favorite Rusty, Russ Williams, or Russ, what's his name, Wilson. Russell. I hardly, yeah, I'll never boy, forget you, Russell boy, Williams. You've, you've moved on. Oh my lord. Uh, anyhow, um, so so what were we talking about? Merrill Hodge. Oh Drake yeah, Hodge. May. Yeah, Drake May. So yeah, I looked at Drake May, yeah, and, and there was a couple of things that concerned me. One, I thought mechanically he was very loopy. He had long arm mechanics, right? Really loopy as he throws. Um, and then two, I thought he was really inaccurate on underneath and intermediate throws. Just some it's a really bad balls. Now, it's funny because you get into the the national television kind of analysts, right? And they talk about they talk about some of the things that he can do. They talk about, oh, the big play over the top or the athleticism to scramble and the, you know, he threw the deep ball really well, all these things, right? And I would tell you that I'm more interested in a guy that can do the boring well. And he doesn't do the boring well. And I don't know how often a guy that can't execute the offense underneath and take the boring, take the stuff that gets you first downs, that keeps you on schedule, I don't know if that guy ever becomes great at that. See, people marvel at the things that happen three times a game. Oh my God! Did you see that throw? He scrambled around, and then he threw it like we see it in the in the uh, workouts all the time, right? The pro days. Oh my God! He was scrambling to the right, and he turned back. He threw it to the left, and it went sixty seven yards, and it was a perfect dime, you know. And we get all enamored. How many times does that happen a game versus what happens on a down to down series to series? Like that. That's what you do, and so. What I get concerned about is a guy that can't do the boring well because I don't know that that guy ever does the boring well. I have this rule about offense in general, and I call it the 70-30 rule, Mike. 70% of the time, we need to be on schedule. 30% of the time, we're off schedule. You need to make a play for us. So if that flat route at six yards is there, you take it 100% of the time. And you make it second down and four or second down and five. And if you're off of that because maybe there's something better on number two, then you're wrong 100% of the time. And I want to be on schedule because if I'm living in third down and two minus or third down and three minus, I'll live for a long time. I'll be able to convert a lot of those. But if I'm living in Third down and seven plus, I'm in trouble. We're in trouble as an offense. And that 30% of the time, if that ratio is off, if you're a 50-50 quarterback, 50% of the time you're on schedule, 50% of the time you're off schedule, you will do more harm to your team than you will do good for your team. Meaning that you know more games are lost than one, and that's the problem I have with quarterbacks and the way we evaluate quarterbacks. We evaluate... We evaluate the things that jump off film as opposed to the boring. 
And the boring is what wins. And the boring is what keeps you on schedule. And the boring is what keeps drives alive. So this this Merrill Hodge critique of Drake May was certainly the most critical uh-huh. that I've heard. Right. But there's been enough smoke out there that would indicate that maybe Drake May's stock is dropping. Is Is this a case of legitimately the whole NFL community coming to a, a sentiment about Drake May? Or is this teams that maybe are back in the draft who really covet Drake May mm. and are poisoning the well to move up in the hopes that Drake May slides to them? Sure. Does that really happen? Yeah. Because if it does, that's pretty shitty. Yeah. That, no. I mean, poisoning the well, right. messing with a guy's reputation, work ethic, all that kind of stuff, just in the hopes that he drops and you secretly love him. Yeah. That's BS. Yeah, well, that uh, there's no but question. But is it real? Yeah, there's no Could question. Could that be happening here? There's no question that it probably is happening to a degree. There there are some teams that have probably looked at Drake May and said, I don't like – like I don't like the mechanics, and uh, just really quick, as a son that had, you know, or as as my son was a, a pitcher, and I've been to all these pitching lists. Let me tell you what happens when you're long. When you're long in your mechanics, you're late. Okay, so for a pitcher that has repeated mechanics, what they always say is keep your front shoulder in, right? So you keep your front shoulder closed, and what ends up happening is that's where your power comes from. So when you're late or your arm legs behind your body, so your body's moving but your arm is legging behind, what ends up happening is your body's natural reaction to get your arm through is to pull your head. So when you pull your head, what happens, instead of being in this position where you're really driving the ball, driving the football or the baseball, what happens is your arm gets longer as you do that. And when your arm gets longer because it's legging behind, you're going to be inaccurate. So it either sails high and, like for a pitcher, high and wide, or you hold on to it too long, and then it's down in the dirt. And the same is true for football players, for quarterbacks. When you get late, when you're late with the fault ball, it's impossible to be accurate because now what ends up happening is you have to pull, and you come off the ball so you don't stay. Your force does not stay behind the ball, right? You tend to you tend to get into as opposed to being a the Joel Clad always says this a C thrower. You become a you thrower. I mean, your hand is under the ball. Mm-hmm. And when you do that, you sail the ball or you pull the ball. It's one of two things. But you can't be accurate if you're late. And you can't be you can't be on time if your mechanics are long. Yeah. And so it, it's one of those things that, you know, everybody will try to fix. And I watched him in his pro day versus the film I watched in several games that I watched. And you could tell he's worked on his mechanics and tightened his mechanics up. But the bottom line is that's bullshit. It doesn't, like, you can do it in shorts and a T-shirt, but when you're under duress, it will always come back muscle to haunt memory, you. Like muscle memory, Ma- yeah, right? It's, yeah, it's a 10,000-hour rule. Yeah. So, um, but but that's that's the issue with that. But will people poison the well? Will people, yeah, I'm sure there's a group of, of franchise teams that that really like him because he's got something <clears throat> that you can't coach. He's got arm talent, size and and athleticism, right? You can't coach that. You're either born with it or you're not. And so he's got all those things. And so, you know, the the prevailing thought for a lot of teams is, well, we can coach him up on the rest of the stuff. And my thought is, really, you think? Cuz more often than not, you can't. There's very few guys that actually, you know, actually learn how to play the game when they get into the professional game. So and and then the other the other factor is will people poison the well? Absolutely. Well, why do you think the Wonderlick tests get yeah. released? Because point. NFL they the they're if they can get you for less money and they want you, will they besmirch your name? Absolutely, cuz a lot of them are turds. So we're going to have possibly six quarterbacks go in the first round. <laughs> Right, uh-huh. Caleb Williams, Daniels, McCarthy, May, mm-hmm. Nix, Penix. Yeah. yeah, so we could have possibly six quarterbacks go in the in the first round. We we know based on a, a solid twenty year history of drafting quarterbacks, most of these guys are going to be busts. Mm. Why? Why so many misses? Is it? Are you telling me that all these evaluators, these general managers, are you telling me that they're that stupid? Mm. Or is it something else? 
Yeah. Um, I think it's I think it's something else. You know, there, there's an old saying that hope is not a strategy. And I think there's a lot of hope with these franchises when it comes to that position. Well, let's just take him because nobody's going to criticize us for taking a quarterback because we need a quarterback. And if he fails, you know, it wasn't our fault. We coached him up. He just couldn't play. He was never accurate enough. He was never whatever. You know, and, and so you get into these situations where it's kind of a cover-your-own-ass mentality. Is, hey, listen, if we draft him and he fails, at least it gives us another two years to kick the can down the road before we get fired. Because if he fails, we're probably going to get fired anyhow. But at least it buys us a couple more years. And people get excited about having a brand-new quarterback. They're excited right up until the point they're not excited. Mm -hmm. And so you can you can survive another year or two or three with that guy that has promise. I mean, think about it. If you're Arizona or the Giants and you've already paid your guy, what are you going to do right now? Now, I mean, you look at that, and he was that guy, whether it was Kyler Murray, he was our guy. You know, he's going to be exciting. He's dynamic. He can move around. He's going to give us a chance. Or if it's Daniel Jones, he's big. He's athletic. He, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's just going to develop into this great. He played, you know, at Duke. He's super smart. Like, he's incredibly intelligent. Blah, blah, blah. Like, and deep down inside, if you're that franchise, you know what you know? This dude ain't taking us to the promised land. This dude does not pass the confetti test. Nope. I can't see confetti falling on him while he's holding up the Lombardi trophy. But you can see, can't you, why that would appeal to a general manager if that's how he looks at these prospects. If he doesn't see a prospect that he truly, truly loves. Right. But if he takes the quarterback, think about what it's done. Because you're right. Young quarterbacks drafted in the first round mm -hmm. inspire a lot of hope, a lot of excitement. And it also creates that – because you know how the fan base is going to react if that young quarterback doesn't work out right away. There will be a litany of excuses that will be made for that quarterback. Oh, well, the system's not right. right. Oh, he doesn't have enough around him. Oh, the offensive coordinator mm -hmm. stinks. Oh, the offensive uh, – the head coach is a defensive-minded head coach. Yeah. We gotta get so there will be all these excuses made. And pretty soon as a general manager, you're sitting back going, damn, I've got – I got four years out of this guy right. before I have to truly admit that he can't play. Right. And, I can see the appeal. Go, I can see the appeal sure, of that. You do for go a through. You go through the when when you figure out internally that he's not very good, and you figure that out pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But then you go through the litany of excuses, like you talked about, and so hey man, we need more. We need to surround him with receivers. You know, then you you do that. Well, our offensive line is not very good. Like you do that, and then. You know, the next thing you know, you got five years that you've survived because you drafted some clown that can't play. And because your fan base so desperately wants that guy right. to work out that they'll feed into the idea that, oh, get a new coach. Right. Or it's that but like darn it, but, offensive coordinator. But if fault you're or, like so for instance, you're the Giants. And you pretty much know no. that you know that Daniel Jones ain't taking you to the promised right. land. But you don't want to dip back into the you're, – you're at number six. You don't want to dip back in, right? You don't want to admit that you made a mistake. So what do you do? Well, our offensive line has been horrible. We haven't had – you know, our receiving core has not been healthy. You know, Shepard can't stay healthy. You know, the other guys just aren't good. We, we drafted – Kadarius Tony couldn't catch the ball. It was a problem. We moved him to Kansas City. You know, on and on and on it goes. And – Ultimately, you know, we went out and got Kenny Galladay, and it was just a bust for us. And so it, it's the receivers. So there's a lot of really good receivers in this class. Let's get him one of those guys. I, I'm watching what's going on and what I'm hearing coming out of L.A. with the Chargers, and I'm, I'm curious if Jim Harbaugh would have been taking this same tack if he didn't already have an established starter in Justin Herbert. But, man, even the offensive lineman in you. Hold on now. Even the offensive mm -hmm. line menu. Is, is Harbaugh not taking this a little too far with his, like, 
everything revolves around the offensive line talk. No, he is not. Uh, no. Not a little too much. Dude, I went and watched Harbaugh clips in my office. I put a tie on the doorknob, <laughs> told my wife not to come in here. I'm watching I'm watching the Chargers Harbaugh clips right now. Yeah, they had a they had football some, porn. Yeah, I did, they had a guy, they had a guy, I don't even know who it is. I guess some guy talking about everything we do is going to be revolving around the offensive line, our strength and conditioning program or, you know, everybody else is going to have to adjust. Our receivers are going to have to adjust because this is what we're doing it for. And I you know, like a little shed a little tear. I was like, this is beautiful, man. This is beautiful. Um, no, I think I think ultimately if I was a Charger fan, man, I'd be so excited from the departure of the garbage that has been going on and the – you know, the analytics, uh, finding ways to lose via analytics um, organization that you have been over the years. I, I just, I, I find I find that aspect of it. The other thing is from a cultural standpoint, I mean, there is no position that I've ever been around that is more in it for the other guy because you realize how dependent you are on the other guy. So, you know, I say this all the time, like there's the most beautiful thing in the world is to walk in to an offensive line meeting on Monday after a game and watch guys fight each other to take responsibility for mistakes. Do you know how rare that is? I have been, I've been in a meeting where I gave up a sack or a pressure and Gary Zimmerman or Tony Jones, my left tackle, would be like, oh, no, 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 man. I had a, like, I had a pretty tight, you know, a pretty tight defensive end technique on me, and I jumped out there. I was supposed to drag hand the three technique. You know, I was supposed to give him body presence before I got, and I had plenty of, or he uh, he was he was a, a wider technique, excuse me, a wide technique, so I could had plenty of time to use a drag hand to protect Stinks outside shoulder and 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 still get to my guy and my responsibility. Like I just kicked out too fast. That's my response. Give me that. Give me the sack. I'll take the sack. And I'd be like, bullshit, Zim. That's not that way. And Tommy Nail go, no, 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 that's mine. I got hung up on the nose guard. I had a one technique. I was supposed to slide to the three technique. So Stink could have gotten outside more. I had an inside presence and inside help. Like I'm a hundred percent responsible for that. And I'd be like, no, you're not, man. That's mine. I'm the dumbass that gave it up. And we would sit there and fight in a meeting to get a negative grade. Like, literally fight in a meeting. Where does that come from? Where does that mindset come from? And is it pretty widespread among offensive lines? I've never met an offensive line that wasn't put together that way. And if you have one of those guys, that guy will get that guy will get excommunicated from the group. As a matter of fact, I had a guy in Denver, when I played in Denver, that did things that drove us all crazy. That wasn't cut from that cloth. And um, one day my own line coach said, I need to talk to you, private. He's like, yeah. Walk into a, you know, into a room, close the door and say, what is it with this guy? Why don't you guys like him? Why do you guys not like him? And I said, because he's not one of the group. Hey, but he rolls in and checks out the film before we all watch it together so he can make up excuses and blame the other guys. I go, that's bullshit, and none of us want him around. That is unacceptable. And, you know, we ostracized that guy to the point of he knew we all hated him. And that's the way that room operates. And so I think from a cultural standpoint, that's the way it should be. You should all be in it for one another, and you should all be sacrificing for one another. And if you're not, you know, you're not going to be. You're not going to be a championship organization. So th- this idea of, of Jim Harbaugh, everything revolves around the offensive line with the Chargers. Okay, that sound. I, I know that sounds great to you, but didn't Indy try that? Didn't Indy really try to build around a dominant offensive line? Didn't Dallas do that? Y- you know, probably about seven, eight years ago, where they really loaded mm. up on the offensive line. How did yeah. it work for them? Um, they were playoff teams. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and ultimately, I think it worked well for them, but they didn't win championships. And you're talking about championships, you know, and then so. Well, in the case of Indy and Dallas, those two teams, I mean, they didn't really even come close. 
Well, they got to the playoffs, yeah. I mean, you get I'm to the playoffs. To, I'm talking about the Super Bowl. Right. You, you get to the playoffs, then you've got a you, you, everybody's got a chance. But then it comes down to, you know, there's there's a lot of other factors that obviously go into that. But I tell you what, you want to you want to win 80 percent of the, you know, if you're just in, on a pick 'em pool, like pick the team that's going to win. You want to win about 80 percent of your your games that you pick. Just show me who has the dominant fronts. Yeah. Offensive and defensive lines. I'll show you who's going to win the game. Probably at an 80 percent clip. So it'll take you to a point, but you've got to be able to execute everywhere else, right? You've got to be able to have a guy that can that can cover a couple of warts. But it's a heck of a position. foundation. It's a great foundation. Great foundation to have. Correct. Uh, you ready to get some questions? Yeah, you bet. Uh, from, the, from you guys, the great viewers. Here's one from uh, Jordan Vanek. Mark, if you're a rookie coming into mm -hmm. the NFL this year, which three coaches – would you want to play for? Ooh, uh, three coaches I'd like to play for. I'd like to play for um, Kyle Shanahan because I think there's probably nobody better in football at understanding everybody's issues. And I think that's so important. I think so many coaches, I think there are so many coaches that, that don't understand all the issues. They understand the issues on their side of the ball, or the issues on the in the passing game, or and I don't think there's anybody better that understands everybody's problems and coaches to overcome those problems. Okay. Same division. I, I I'd say the same thing for Sean McVay. I think Sean does an exceptional job of understanding his players. Um, understanding what they're trying to do, educating his players. Um, you know, you sit down with a Sean McVay coach player and you, you're you talking to a guy that really understands football. Um, and so I think that would be that that would be a guy that would be on my list. I, I tell you, a guy that's getting a second opportunity to be a head coach in this league, Dan Quinn. Because I think Dan Quinn has an ability to connect with the guys he coaches and – like it's a brutal business, and you know you got to make tough decisions on on cutting people and things of that nature. But I think there there's a genuine there's a genuine love for his his players that um, that it's real. And I I watch the way he's operated as a coach in Atlanta and and how his guys feel about him. And and so I think that that's I think that's a guy that I'd like to play for. No, Andy Reid. Andy Reid would steal my chicken nuggets. Yes. <laughs> Let me have a little bit of them nuggets. <laughs> You're right. All of a sudden you see a little a hand. Dad. Yeah. That's a great. <laughs> I don't want anybody stealing my nuggets. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Andy Reid, you'd make the list. You're on my list. But Mark doesn't want you to take his nuggets. No, I don't want you to steal my food, Andy. Yes. Yeah. And his corn. He's a big believer in you, corn. That's right. Leave his corn alone. Leave my corn alone. Leave his corn. Here's another question for you. Mark, what should the Bears do with the ninth pick? We know what they're doing with the first pick. Yeah. What yeah. about the ninth pick? You know, everybody, every, I, I see people all the time talk about that ninth pick as, you know, I, I've seen a bunch of mock drafts with like a receiver or something like that in there. Dude, I'd, I'd either get one of the tackles. There's a bunch of offensive tackles that are supposed to go really high and supposed to be really good. And, you know, they've drafted tackles over over the last couple of years. But, shoot, I'm not, I'm not a, like, moving from outside as a tackle to inside is, it, it's a pretty easy move. There's, you got guys on both sides. Of you. You're playing in a phone booth. So a guy that you're not sure can be your all-time tackle, if you draft a tackle and move that guy inside, it just – I think that's an easy transition. I think it strengthens and bolsters your offensive line. Or like a guy that's a big-time edge, big-time – or, or big-time three technique. I think something on the line of scrimmage, either defensively or offensively, is where I would go if I was Chicago Bears. Because you went out and you got Keenan Allen, who's awesome, yeah. DJ Moore the year before – Who's an awesome player at the quarterback position? You've got Komet at the tight end position, who's really, you know, really improving. I think you have, uh, I think you're fine. I think you're fine there. And ultimately, I think 
you know, you beat some people up with a rookie quarterback. You you get you take some pressure off that guy. That's that's kind of how I feel. Yeah, because you know, a lot of these teams, you you take a, a lineman, you take a tackle in the first round. It's kind of a wah wah wah. Remember remember Detroit? Yeah, it took Penny Sewell, and people were like, yeah, all right, and it turned out to be the best pick they possibly could have made. But Dan Campbell it, would tell you, and I've asked him several times, who's the best player on your team? Without hesitation, and it's not even close. Without hesitation, Penn Sewell. But see, the Bears have the uh, real real ability here to do something that's really easy for their fans to like because you take the quarterback, then you take the lineman. Mm-hmm. Now you can kind of put them together as a right. package deal, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. As opposed to just taking the lineman by himself. This way you've already, since you're getting the quarterback, it's freed you up. Right. You don't have to go the easy way and just take a receiver to pair with the quarterback. Right. You can do what the smart thing is and take that lineman and go, hey, here's our quarterback. And here's his yeah. His here's his whoopee right. for the next right. And their GM is a, their GM's a former offensive right. lineman, right? Right. So, I think that's the direction I'd go. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Thank yeah. you for the questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thank we'll you. Uh, always throw those out whenever we're doing one of these podcasts. Yeah, science nerd, don't get at me. I don't even want to hear about it anymore. Uh, for everybody involved in the Sneak Truth Podcast, I'm Mark Slayer with Mike Evans. Thank you so much for being a part of it, and we'll be back with you later on in the week. Hey, for everybody involved in the Stinky Truth, we thank you so much. Thank you for watching. Uh, If you enjoyed the video, please make sure you don't forget to give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel for more content just like this. If you want to see more of our videos, you can also be sure to check out our playlist. Let us know exactly what you think in the comments below. Uh, We appreciate you guys so much for being a part of that. Don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest Updates, links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.